Their achievement is recaptured by Ken Kelly. Flying the airplane is just very, very scary. You lay in a prone position on the wing. It's uncomfortable. Your, your back is arched. Uh, your left hand on the lever, which controls the canards in the front. Your right hand really just trying to hold your body up and balance you. The canards controlled pitch up and down. They would also offer protection in the event of a crash. By moving the hip cradle from side to side, the wings could be warped to control rolling. This action also moved the rudders so the flyer could be turned to left or right. Its first flight is recalled by the Wright brothers' niece, Mrs. Ivanette Miller. I was seven years old and in the second grade. That was on a Thursday. I'm sure I went to school that, that day. Nothing unusual happened until early in the evening before dinner when Aunt Catherine came to our house with a telegram saying the boys had flown. The age of flight began in an empty field in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. It was 10.30 in the morning, December 17, 1903. With a toss of a coin, Orville won the right to roll into history. The first flight lasted only 12 seconds. The flyer rose four times that day. On the final flight, Wilbur soared over 290 meters in 59 seconds. Four years later, the first passengers could experience the new thrill of air travel. Uncle Orv called on the telephone and said that he would take his three nieces up if he'd come out to the flying field. So all three of us went out on the interurban. We stopped at Sims Station where their flying field was. He gave the uh, sign that he was going to start and he revved up the engine and the propellers and away we went. We sat on the lower wing with our feet braced against a strut. I looked out over the wings that were carrying us up and the ground that was falling away. This was free, open flying, and there's nothing like it. Nothing. We're really happy with it. I mean, it's just, it's everything they said it would be, which is really strange, because, you know, you make something, it never turns out that way. So you bought this as a kit? Yeah, it's called right. a kit. You get gla fiberglass, oh. you get resin, you get foam, things like that, but you've got to actually create it. Was it like a manual or something that you... Oh, you get a great, it's great, yeah, it's a big book. So they tell you... They, tell, like they tell you, you what? <laughs> they do, they do, they actually... Take the paintbrush out of the... Literally, literally, they say, you know, you, with your left hand, do this, with your right hand, do that. Requiring at least 1,000 hours of work, building this plane is not for the faint-hearted. Although it demands no special skills or tools, the final cost could run from $6,000 to $14,000. The plans alone are $200. When it's completed, it will be a Rutan Long Easy. It's made from styrofoam, fiberglass, and epoxy resin. Rutan designs are part of a revolution that is changing the shape of aeroplanes. The winglets on the nose of the aircraft are canards, once used by the Wright brothers, now revived to make Rutan aircraft safer and more stable than conventional aeroplanes. Extra stability also comes from the tip sails fitted to the wings. Designer Bert Rutan. The most common fatal general aviation accident is, is the, the maneuver in which the pilot turns too sharply uh, to line up on the runway for landing in stalls at low altitude and thus enters a spin or loses altitude and flies into the ground before he can maintain control and climb. Uh, 
these airplanes uh, are relatively immune to that in that if they get too slow, they can still just complete the turn without the stall. In a water tunnel, colored fluid simulates the flow of air over the cross section of an aircraft wing. As the wing angle increases, the smooth flow over the top eventually becomes turbulent. The wing stalls, losing lift, and the aircraft drops. In rutan designs, the canards in front are set to stall before the main wing. As the angle of the aircraft increases, the airflow becomes turbulent. The canards lose their lift and stall first. When the canard stalls, the aircraft pitches nose down, lowering the angle of the main wing. In this way, the canard prevents the aircraft from reaching a dangerously high angle and stalling completely. This effect is called stall limiting. It makes the long easy almost foolproof. In the world of aviation, Burt Rutan's designs have become legendary. Safe, lightweight, and economical, the long easy can fly almost 4,000 spectacular design. As it slips through the desert air, the Voyager prepares to meet aviation's last major challenge. It's designed to fly around the world, 38,000 kilometers, non-stop, without refueling. Rutan's concepts will be put to the ultimate test. Slender and willowy, the aircraft's low weight and high strength require a minimum of power. Empty, the Voyager weighs just over 400 kilograms. When fully loaded with fuel, it will weigh more than 10 times as much, some five tons. The pilots for this two-week ordeal, Gina Yeager and Bert Rutan's brother, Dick. This is basically what the airplane is constructed of. And it's a very thin, uh, high-strength, magnemite graphite facings on one side and the other. And in the center, it's a low-density honeycomb core. And uh, actually, this type of advanced composites is really what makes this mission uh, actually possible. Now this honeycomb is made out of paper and it's bonded and I'll just peel it apart here. You can see that it's very porous and it's very strong. Actually for every square foot it's about uh, less than a quarter of a pound. This is the space age material and this is the, the material that airplanes are going to be made out of out of the future and not aluminum anymore. And although carbon is as stiff as steel, uh, there's still quite a bit of flexing in the airplane. That's why the, uh, that's why the airplane needs to be span-loaded with fuel as much as possible. It will take about 13 days to circle the globe. For the crew, it's a physical as well as a technological challenge. The doctor will be working with us on the, crew, the compatibility in the airplane with the fatigue, uh, noise fatigue and other factors in the program. Uh, it, there are some psychologists that will be working with us and helping us with the circadian rhythm, which is the same thing as the jet lag that will offset our schedule. When we're not flying, we'll be in, one of us will be in the back area, the sleeping area, and we'll be in off-duty. We'll either be asleep or we'll be taking down data. It's a technical achievement. Uh, that's kind of the business we're in, uh, so why not? <laughs> Starship One. With this design, Rutan's innovations shift from the world of the hobbyist into a billion dollar market. As the prototype of a new generation of business aircraft, the Starship's safe, high speed, long range design is 30% more fuel efficient than its more conventional rivals. For the boardroom set, the Starship is the shape of things to come. One of the 
the secrets of the Harrier's success is its lightweight construction using advanced composite materials in place of metals. Sheets of carbon fiber are cut into patterns by automated knife blades. These techniques are borrowed from the garment industry. Similar to materials used in Rutan's Voyager, these composites are lighter than aluminum, but stronger than steel. As many as 40 layers of carbon fiber are laminated in a pattern tailored to produce stiffness and strength in any desired direction. The laminated sheets, once molded to the aerofoil shape, are heated to permit bonding. Some of the tools look disarmingly primitive. The entire upper surface of the Mark II Harrier's wing is made from composites. Carbon fibers have created new life in an industry where the time from the drawing board to the scrapyard is often remarkably brief. Defense budgets gave us this high-altitude supersonic bomber nobody wanted. And the Blackbird spy plane, the world's fastest jet aircraft. These are technological marvels, but outside the wars they are supposed never to fight, it's hard to find uses to justify their huge costs. Some research planes are true exotics. The scissor wing tested a new but unsuccessful form of variable wing sweep. HIMAT was the last word in model test planes. Flown by a ground-based pilot and tried with a multitude of wing shapes, it explored extremes of maneuverability under electronic control. With swept forward wings and canards, the X-29 is the first X-craft to be built in a decade. Its revolutionary shape is designed to give it the maneuverability tested in HIMAT, the snappy agility needed to aim missiles more accurately and more rapidly. Swept forward wings also allow the X-29 to use less power than its predecessors, while flying faster and remaining in the air longer, always a crucial factor in fighter aircraft whose combat endurance is often measured in minutes rather than hours. The advantage of swept forward wings has been known for decades, but they tend to tear off at high speeds. Reinforced with the new high-strength, lightweight carbon fibers, the wings of the X-29 are made to avoid such catastrophes. The unprecedented agility designed into the X-29 makes it so inherently unstable it can only be flown through computers. These were first tested with small models in NASA wind tunnels. The X-29 is controlled through digital fly-by-wire. Three computers interpret the pilot's commands and relay them electronically to the aircraft's control surfaces 40 times a second. Without these adjustments, which make the X-29 so stable and yet so responsive, it would be fly-by-prayer. The X-29 would tumble out of the sky and disintegrate in seconds. With its computers, canards, forward-swept wings, and electronic nervous system, the X-29 is a radical challenge for its test pilot, Chuck Sewell. I've been involved with the uh, testing of the airplane for about two years now. Uh, we've flown it many, many hours in the simulator, developing the flight control system and looking at the handling quality. The X-29's maiden flight had the atmosphere of a space shot. On the ground, 130 engineers monitored every move and awaited the outcome. Planning has been meticulous, but there are no guarantees. The burden of proof rests with the test pilot, his 33 years of experience, and his knowledge that of his 800 predecessors, more than 100 of them were killed by their machines. 
In December 1984, the investment of eight years of research and $140 million paid off. The X-29 took off to explore the frontiers of flight, to advance aircraft design, avionics, and the science of new materials. The sinister offspring of this aerodynamic embryo will be tomorrow's advanced tactical fighters. Just a part of the arsenal science has sold us for a crippling price. Once again, we've reached the pinnacle of inspiration in our search for more elegant, efficient, and costly ways to kill each other. Through intensive research, an invention that has brought the world closer together has evolved into this sobering paradox. It seems a long way back from this war toy, this supersonic dart, to that awkward first flight on the sand dunes of North Carolina. Beyond the dilemma of knowing how we can use our knowledge, beyond the nightmare of knowing what will happen if we misuse it, survives the dream of those who can at last hang on to the wind. <laughs> 